Hello and welcome to the review of the Guyton and Hall Medical Physiology textbook. Today we will be starting at chapter one, which essentially goes through what homeostasis is, also describes physiology in general, and then it talks about some of the mechanisms by which the body is actually able to maintain a, a normal internal environment. As we go through each chapter, we're essentially just going to be reading from the actual text. So it should hopefully cater to a lot of different levels of knowledge. I will just review what I think is most interesting or most important. If you find something else interesting, please just feel free to comment and we can turn it into a, a discussion. Otherwise, this should just serve as a, a nice review of each chapter. If you enjoy the video, please give it a like and subscribe. It will really help the channel. So it starts by describing exactly what physiology is. And it essentially tries to explain the specific characteristics and mechanisms of the human body. And making up the entire body is essentially a trillion cells within the body. All of these cells have its own specific function. When a group of cells all have the same function, then you actually get an organ. An organ is just a collection of cells all with the same specific function working together for one purpose. But every cell does have a similar characteristic and that's that it uses oxygen and combines it with carbohydrate, fat or protein to really release energy to be able to perform those functions. Otherwise, they, they are all uh, individual, or at least a, a collection of individuals in the case of an organ. The human body itself is actually made up of around about 60% of fluid. And all of this fluid is actually within two separate compartments, is an easiest way to think about it. The intracellular fluid, so that fluid within the cell itself, and then the extracellular fluid, so fluid which is outside of the cell. And this fluid is actually in constant motion versus the intracellular fluid, which is remaining rather static within the cell. And all of these cells will live in the same environment. So although they, they may perform different functions, they live within the same environment. And that relates to exactly what homeostasis is trying to achieve, and that's the, the same internal environment for all those cells to be able to function. To go through some of the differences between the extracellular and intracellular fluid, we can start at the actual components within it. So the extracellular fluid contains a large amount of sodium and chloride and bicarbonate ions, but also contains all of these nutrients that the cell requires. So oxygen, glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, um, in addition to the waste products which are produced, such as carbon dioxide. Whereas the intracellular fluid actually contains a lot of potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. So as we've already described, homeostasis is essentially that maintenance of that internal environment. Since all of these cells are kind of bathed in the same environment, the, the body wants to maintain a, a relatively normal, constant state for them to be able to function. Disease, however, is actually a disruption to homeostasis. So something that alters either the internal environment or alters a homeostatic mechanism, uh, which then impacts its function. The body can also compensate for any disruption to these homeostatic mechanisms and correct uh, any issue. However, if the compensation is too vigorous, sometimes that can actually disrupt other homeostatic mechanisms or other areas of the body. And it can actually be quite hard to distinguish the primary cause for the disruption versus the compensatory response. And that's essentially what pathophysiology is. That's trying to explain the different physiological processes in disease and injury. In terms of the, the movement of the extracellular fluid, as we had mentioned, it's in constant motion. Extracellular fluid is actually separated into another two different compartments, the circulatory system and then the interstitial fluid, which is the space between individual cells. This diagram here, figure one, one shows the circulatory system in a rather simplistic way, where blood leaves the heart or the left side of the heart and goes to the various organs where the nutrients are used, then is returned to the right side of the heart, which then goes through the lungs to be reoxygenated, and then pumps right back around. This diagram here shows the 
interstitial fluid and the actual cellular level. So that's a blown up area of, of this region. And these tiny little blood vessels are called capillaries and they're providing all of those nutrients to these cells. And the pathways between the blood vessels to the cells are very, very short. And as you can see, nutrients can tr transport straight into the interstitial fluid, which still is within the extracellular fluid compartment, but then also goes straight into a cell. And that really summarizes what the body is. It's essentially a compartment which is transporting and utilizing different nutrients and then excreting the waste products that are produced. And that is reinforced with our different organ systems. So the respiratory system in the lungs absorbs all of the oxygen. The gastrointestinal tract absorbs the nutrients such as carbohydrates, fatty acids, and amino acids. The liver is the area where all of these nutrients are processed into more usable forms and also where waste products are produced or toxic substances are, are broken down. Then the musculoskeletal system, which essentially is a way for the body to actually move to collect more nutrients or excrete those wastes. Those wastes that are removed include carbon dioxide within the lungs, the kidneys, which remove essentially every other waste other than carbon dioxide, so urea, water, ions, and it does that by filtering large quantities of plasma within the blood and then reabsorbing all of the good nutrients and leaving the waste products within the tubule itself, which we will get to in, in later chapters, uh, to be excreted through the urinary system. The gastrointestinal tract excretes undigested material and also some waste products of metabolism, in addition to the liver, as we've already talked about, which detoxifies and removes a lot of drugs and, and unwanted uh, chemicals, which is excreted through the feces through the biliary system. When talking about how the body actually functions and how it's regulated, then we have the nervous system, which is a sensory input, and then a central nervous system, which processes all of those sensory inputs, and then sends out an output to the motor system. So you have a, a input, which is telling you, you know, what is going on, the central nervous system, which then processes that, that input, and then decides what the action will be. And then a part of the nervous system is the autonomic nervous system. And this part of the nervous system is essentially the subconscious portion, where organs are told what to do without us knowing that they're being told to do that, such as the gastrointestinal system, moving and functioning with us, without us actually knowing on a day to day. And uh, same with our heart beating at different rates to meet different needs. And then we also have our hormonal system, which consists of the endocrine glands and they secrete hormones, which get transported around the body to tell different cells to function in different ways. A good example of that is insulin that gets released during a meal to then tell the cells to utilize or store glucose to reduce our, our glucose levels. And then the body is protected uh, so that it can continue these functions without getting diseased through the immune system, which includes white blood cells that are able to distinguish our own cells and not, not attack them, and then go over and attack any foreign and invading cells or bacteria or proteins. We also have our skin, uh, which covers cushions and protects our deeper tissues, but then also has functions in temperature regulation, excretion of various wastes, and also as a, a sensory interface as a way that we actually can feel our environment. And then reproduction, which is the way that we can uh, continue to reproduce new human beings and continue living the good life. All of these mechanisms are controlled in various ways, and they do give us some examples of specific homeostatic mechanisms and how they're controlled. We won't dive into details on each of these systems because they are explained in much more detail in later chapters. But what they are trying to describe is that if an organ becomes diseased or has a disruption to its homeostatic mechanism, there are feedback loops within that organ to try and correct itself. But then there are also feedback loops in other organ systems to try and help out as well. So we have um, just briefly the examples with, if you say you have a raise in carbon dioxide level, you're going to increase your ventilation to breathe off that carbon dioxide. 
if you have a drop in your blood pressure, you're going to have mechanisms in place to increase your blood pressure. And each of these homeostatic mechanisms that we have are kept within a pretty narrow range. And that's shown here in table 1.1, one, one, where you can see the normal range for each of these components is kept within a fairly narrow window and any disruption outside of those those ranges spurs on a, a change to try and bring it back into a normal range and it does that through negative feedback loops and that's all described here uh, like i said where if carbon dioxide increases there is a signal that is told within our brain to tell us to breathe faster, increase ventilation, breathe off more carbon dioxide, reduce the carbon dioxide levels. And then we have a, a way to actually describe how well our negative feedback system is at actually maintaining homeostasis. And that's all through this calculation for gain. There is an example here, but it is a, a, a little bit confusing. Um, but give it a read if it does help you. Uh, an easy way to think about it is say we have a potassium level um, just arbitrarily. This is, is just an example, a potassium level of five. And then we go and eat a banana, which would, without any homeostatic mechanism, increase our potassium to let's say 10. This is not a real life scenario because you would be dead at 10. So you eat one banana which contains a lot of potassium and your blood level goes up to 10 if you did not have a homeostatic mechanism. But let's say in our case that we do have a homeostatic mechanism and it only raises to 6. So the correction that has been made is the difference between what would have been without the homeostatic mechanism and what is with the homeostatic mechanism. So in this case it's 4, that's our correction. And then the error is the, the change that is still occurring despite the homeostatic mechanism. So it wasn't able to keep the potassium at 5 despite having a banana and it still went up to 6. So our error is 1. So 4 divided 1 gives us a gain of 4. So a, a better homeostatic control mechanism or better feed, negative feedback would have a higher gain because our correction would be higher and our error would be lower. So why is it negative feedback that we use? Um, if we use positive feedback, then as you could imagine, if a signal results in more of a action, which then results in another signal to create the same action, you're going to have a circle, a spiraling, uh, well, they call it a vicious circle, uh, where it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, we do have some examples of where it is actually useful. And they talk about blood clotting here, where if you want to form a clot, it's obviously better to try to continually form a clot until it forms. Um, you've got childbirth where obviously if you get the signal to give birth, then you want to continue all of those physiological mechanisms to be able to give birth. And then the generation of nerve single signals where one nerve sends off a signal and then propagates another nerve signal, then another one. However, what's important to note here is that each of these positive feedback loops are within an overarching ne negative feedback process. So for example, the blood clotting, that's only occurring because we've had some blood loss. So in order to stop the blood loss, which is a negative feedback loop, is to create some blood clotting. And then lastly, um, they talk about adaptive control here and give the neurological example here where say you had an input that required an instantaneous output before you can actually process it. Um, then your body will go ahead and instantly produce that output and then process it after the fact. And then if during that process you realize, okay, we did too strong of an output or too weak of an output, next time we're going to do it this way. And that's essentially a delayed negative feedback loop. 
So that really summarizes our chapter and how homeostasis is maintained within the body. And the real goal is to make sure each cell is able to function normally. And if there's a disruption to one system, then we may have a disruption to another system. Uh, but there are compensatory responses trying to correct these disruptions. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any feedback, I'd love to hear um, your comments. Otherwise, please join us for the following chapters.